Thoughts lead to feelings, feelings lead to activities, and activities lead to results. Everything starts with your thoughts that are produced by your brain. Isn't it astonishing that our brain is pretty much the basis for our life and yet most of us have no idea as to how this potent apparatus functions? So let's begin by taking a simple look at how your brain works. Metaphorically, your mind is nothing more than a huge file cabinet, similar to what you'd find in your office or home. All data that comes in is labeled and filed in folders so that it's easy to retrieve to help you survive. Did you hear that? I didn't say thrive, I said survive. In each situation, you go to the files of your brain to determine how to react. Say, for instance, you're considering a financial opportunity. You automatically go to your file labeled cash and from there decide what to do. The only thoughts you may have about cash will be what are stored in your cash file. That's all you may think about because that's all that is in your brain under that category. Let's have a look at how to use these files correctly. Secrets of the Subconscious Millionaire Mind How to wire your financial blueprint to create unlimited wealth on autopilot in an internet age. Chapter 1 The Way We Think Synopsis you decide based on what you feel is logical, judicious, and appropriate for you at the time. You make what you believe is the correct choice. The issue, however, is that your correct choice might not be a successful choice. In fact, what makes perfect sense to you might systematically produce utterly poor results. For example, let's say I'm in the mall. I see this green handbag on sale for 25% off. I immediately go to my brain files with the question, should I get this handbag? In a nanosecond, my brain files come back with the response, you've been seeking a green handbag to go with those green shoes you purchased last week. Purchase it. As I rush to the checkout, my brain isn't only thrilled about having this beautiful handbag but glowing with pride because it's 25% off. To my brain, this purchase makes utter sense. However, at no point did my brain come up with the thought true, this is a truly nice handbag, and true, this is a good deal, but today I'm $3,000 in debt, so I'd better wait. I didn't come up with that data because no file in my brain contains that. The file of when you're in debt, don't purchase any more, was never established and doesn't exist, which means that specific choice isn't an option. Do you catch my drift? Our brains. If you've got files in your cabinet that are not supportive to financial success, those will be the sole choices you may make. They'll be instinctive, automatic, and make utter sense to you. But ultimately, they'll still produce financial failure or mediocrity at the best. Conversely, if you've got brain files that support financial success, you'll naturally and automatically arrive at choices that produce success. You won't have to consider it. Your normal way of thinking will result in success, sort of like Donald Trump. His pattern way of thinking brings about wealth. When it comes to cash, wouldn't it be unbelievable if you could inherently think how wealthy people think? Well, you may. The opening move to any change is awareness, meaning the opening move to thinking the way wealthy individuals think is to know how wealthy individuals think. Rich individuals think really differently from poor and middle class individuals. They think differently about cash, wealth, themselves, others, and pretty well every other aspect of life. We're going to examine a few of these differences and, as part of your reconditioning, install alternative wealth files into your brain. With fresh files come fresh choices. You may then catch yourself when you're thinking like poor and middle-class individuals and consciously switch your focus to how wealthy individuals think. Remember, you may decide to think in ways that will support you in your happiness and success rather than ways that don't. 
A few cautions to start out. In no way, shape, or form do I mean to demean poor individuals. I don't believe that rich individuals are better than poor people. They're just richer. At the same time, I wish to make certain you get the message, so I'm going to make the distinctions between the rich and poor as extreme as possible. When I talk about rich, poor, and middle class individuals, what I'm referring to is their mindset, how different people think and act instead of the actual sum of money they've got or their value to society. I'll be generalizing. Again, my objective is to make certain you get the point of every principle and utilize it. For the most part, I will not always be referring to the middle class specifically, because middle class individuals commonly have a mix of rich and poor mindsets. Several of the precepts might appear to deal more with habits and activities than with ways of thinking. Our activities come from our feelings, which come from our thoughts. Consequently, every rich activity is preceded by a rich way of thinking. Finally, I'm going to ask you to be willing to relinquish being right. What I mean by that is, be willing to relinquish having to do it your way. How come? As your way has gotten you precisely what you've got today. If you wish more of the same, continue doing it your way. If you're not yet wealthy, however, Perhaps it's time you consider another way. It's up to you. The concepts you're about to learn are simple, but profound. They make true changes for real individuals in real life. If you learn them and utilize them, I'm confident they'll transform your life too. At the end of each section, you'll come across a proclamation and a physical movement with which to anchor it into your body. You'll likewise find activities to take do support you in acquiring this wealth file. It's crucial you put each file into action in your life as rapidly as possible so that the knowledge can move to a physical, cellular level and produce lasting and permanent change. Most individuals understand we're creatures of habit, but what they don't recognize is that there are really two kinds of habits, doing habits and not doing habits. Everything you're not doing right now, you're in the habit of not doing. The only way to alter these not doing habits into doing habits is to do them. Studying will assist you, but it's a whole different world when you go from studying to doing. If you're really serious about success, prove it and do the activities suggested. Chapter 2 What we bring about in our lives Synopsis if you wish to produce wealth, it's crucial that you trust that you're at the wheel of your life, particularly your financial life. If you don't trust this, then you must inherently trust that you've little or no control over your life, and therefore you've little or no command over your financial success. That's not a wealthy attitude. Did you ever notice that it's commonly poor individuals who spend a fortune playing the lottery? They really trust their wealth is going to come from somebody picking their name out of a hat. Sure, everybody wishes to win the lottery, and even wealthy individuals play for fun once in a while. But first, they don't spend half their pay on tickets, and second, winning the lotto is not their chief scheme for producing wealth. You have to trust that you're the one who produces your success, that you're the one who produces your mediocrity, and that you're the one producing your struggle around cash and success. Consciously or unconsciously, it's still you. Rather than taking responsibility for what's happening in their lives, poor individuals choose to play the role of the victim. A victim's prevailing thought is often, poor me. So presto, by virtue of the law of intent, that's literally what victims get they get to be poor. Note that I said they play the role of victim. I didn't say they are victims. I don't believe anybody is a victim. I believe individuals play the victim as they believe it gets them something. What we get. How may you tell when individuals are playing the victim? They leave three obvious clues. Clue number one, fault. 
When it comes to why they're not wealthy, most victims are pros at the fault game. The object of this game is to see how many individuals and conditions you may point the finger at without ever viewing yourself. It's fun for victims at least. Regrettably, it's not such a blast for anybody else who's ill-fated enough to be around them. That's because those in close proximity to victims become easy targets. Victims fault the economic system, they fault the government, the stock exchange, their broker their type of business, their employer, their employees, their manager, the head office, their upline or downline, they fault customer service, they fault the shipping department, their partner, their mate, the higher power, and naturally they always blame their parents. It's always somebody else or something else that's to blame. The issue is anything or anybody but them. Clue number two, rationalizing. If victims aren't faulting, you'll frequently find them rationalizing their situation by stating something like money's not truly significant. Let me ask you this question. If you stated that your mate or your boyfriend or your partner or your friend weren't all that significant, would any of them be around for long? I don't believe so and neither would cash. Would you have a motorcycle if it weren't significant to you? Naturally not. Would you have a pet if it weren't significant to you? Naturally not. In the same way, if you don't believe cash is significant, you plainly won't have any. You may really dazzle your acquaintances with this insight. Imagine you're in a conversation with an acquaintance who tells you, Money's not significant. Put your hand on your forehead and look up as if you're getting a message from the heavens, then shout, you're broke. To which your shocked acquaintance will undoubtedly reply, how did you know? Then you hold out your palm and you respond, what else do you wish to know? That'll be $50, please. Let me put it flat out, anybody who states cash isn't significant doesn't have any. Rich individuals understand the importance of cash and the place it has in our society. On the other hand, poor individuals validate their financial clumsiness by utilizing irrelevant comparisons. They'll argue, well, cash isn't as significant as love. Now, is that comparison dense or what? What's more crucial, your arm or your leg? Perhaps they're both significant. Listen up, my friends, cash is extremely significant in the areas in which it works, and exceedingly insignificant in the areas in which it doesn't. And although love might make the world go round, it certainly doesn't pay for the building of any hospitals, churches, or houses. It likewise doesn't feed anyone. No wealthy individuals believe money isn't significant. Clue number three, whining. Whining is the absolute worst possible thing you may do for your health or your wealth. The worst. How come? I'm a huge believer in the universal law that states, what you center on expands. When you're whining, what are you centering on, what's correct with your life or what's wrong with it? You're evidently centering on what's wrong with it, and since what you center on expands, you'll keep acquiring more of what's wrong. A lot of teachers in the personal development field discuss the law of attraction. It says that like attracts like, meaning that when you're whining, you're really attracting crap into your life. Have you ever noticed that whiners commonly have a bad life? They say, naturally I whine, look how lousy my life is. And now that you know better, you may explain to them, no, it's because you whine that your life is so lousy. Be quiet, and don't stand near me. Which brings us to a different point. You have to make darn certain not to put yourself in the proximity of whiners. If you utterly have to be nearby, make certain you bring a steel umbrella, or the crap meant for them will get you also. Here's some preparation that I promise will alter your life. For the following seven days, I challenge you to not whine at all. Not just aloud, but in your head too. 
But you have to do it for the entire seven days. How come? Because for the beginning few days, you might still have some residual crap coming to you from previously. Regrettably, crap doesn't travel at light speed, you know. It travels at the speed of crap, so it may take a while to clean out. Fault, rationalization, and whining are like pills. They're nothing more than tension reducers. They alleviate the tension of failure. Consider it. If an individual weren't failing in some way, shape, or form, would he or she have to fault, rationalize, or whine? The obvious answer is no. From now on, as you hear yourself disastrously faulting, rationalizing, or whining, cease and desist at once. Remind yourself that you're producing your life and that at each moment you'll be attracting either success or crap into your life. It's crucial you pick your thoughts and words sagely. Now you're ready to hear one of the biggest secrets in the world. Are you ready? Read this cautiously. There's no such thing as a truly wealthy victim. Did you get that? Besides, who would listen? What, I got a scratch in my yacht. To which almost anybody would reply, who gives a damn? What do individuals get out of being a victim? The answer is attention. Believe me, it's nearly impossible to be really happy and successful when you're perpetually aching for attention. Because if it's attention you wish, you're at the mercy of other people. You commonly wind up as a people pleaser begging for approval. Attention seeking is likewise an issue, as individuals tend to do stupid things to get it. Now, as I stated, there's no such thing as a wealthy victim. So to remain a victim, attention seekers make darn sure they never get wealthy. It's time to choose. You may be a victim or you may be wealthy, but you can't be both. Listen up. Each time, and I mean each time, you fault, rationalize, or whine, you're slitting your financial throat. It's time to repossess your power and acknowledge that you produce everything that's in your life and everything that is not in it. Recognize that you produce your wealth, your non-wealth, and each level in between. Proclamation, place your hand on your heart and state. I produce the precise level of my financial success. Touch your head and state. I've a millionaire mind. Each time you catch yourself faulting, rationalizing, or whining, slide your forefinger across your neck as a trigger to prompt yourself that you're slitting your financial throat. Even though this gesture might seem a bit crude to do to yourself, it's no more crude than what you're doing to yourself by faulting, rationalizing, or whining, and it will finally work to ease these destructive habits. Accomplish a debrief. At the end of every day, put down one thing that went well and one thing that didn't. Then write the answer to the accompanying question, how did I produce each of these situations? If other people were involved, inquire, what was my part in producing each of these situations? This drill will keep you accountable for your life and make you aware of the techniques that are working for you and the techniques that are not. Chapter 3 Playing to Win or Lose Synopsis Poor individuals play the cash game on defense instead of offense. Let me ask you, if you were to play any sport or any game purely on defense, what are the chances of your succeeding at that game? Most individuals would agree, slim and none. Yet that's precisely how most individuals play the cash game. Their chief concern is survival and security rather than producing wealth and abundance. What is your real intent? The goal of really rich individuals is to have monumental wealth and abundance. Not just some cash, but lots of cash. So what is the big goal of poor individuals? To have enough to pay the bills, and on time would be a miracle, let me tell you of the power of intent. When your intent is to have enough to pay the bills, 
that's precisely how much you'll acquire, simply enough to pay the bills and not a dime more. Middle-class individuals at least go a pace further, too bad it's a midget pace. Their big goal in life likewise happens to be their favorite word in the whole wide world. They simply wish to be comfortable. I hate to break the news to you, but there's a big difference between being comfy and being wealthy. Accomplishments I have to admit, I didn't always recognize that. But one of the reasons I trust I've the right to even write this book is that I've had the experience of being on all three sides of the proverbial fence. I've been super broke, as in having to borrow a dollar for fuel for my car. But let me qualify that. First of all, it wasn't my car. Second, that dollar came in the form of four quarters. Do you know how embarrassing it is for a grown-up to pay for gas with four quarters? The kid at the pump looked at me as though I were some sort of vending machine robber and then simply shook his head and laughed. I don't know if you are able to relate, but it was definitely among my financial low points and regrettably merely one of them. Once I got my act together, I graduated to the level of being comfy. Comfy is nice. At least you go out to decent restaurants for a change. But pretty much all I could order was chicken. Now, there's nothing wrong with chicken, if that's what you truly want. But frequently it's not. As a matter of fact, individuals who are only financially comfy commonly decide on what to eat by viewing the right-hand side of the menu, the price side. What would you like for supper tonight, dear? I'll have this $8 dish. Let's see what it is. Surprise, it's the chicken, for the 19th time this week. When you're comfy, you don't dare let your eyes view the bottom of the menu, for if you did, you may come across the most forbidden words in the middle-class dictionary, market value. And even if you were curious, you'd never ask what the price really is. First, as you know you can't afford it. Second, it's downright embarrassing once you know the waiter doesn't believe you when he tells you the dish is $46 with side dishes extra and you state, you know what, somehow, I have a real craving for chicken tonight. I have to say that for me personally, among the best things about being wealthy isn't having to view the prices on the menu any longer. I eat precisely what I wish to eat regardless of the price. I may assure you, I didn't do that when I was bust or comfy. It comes down to this, if your goal is to be comfy, chances are you'll never get wealthy. But if your goal is to be wealthy, chances are you'll wind up mighty comfy. Among the principles I teach is if you shoot for the stars, you'll at any rate hit the moon. Poor individuals don't even shoot for the ceiling in their home, and then they wonder why they're not successful. Well, they just learned. You get what you really intend to get. If you wish to get wealthy, your goal has to be wealthy. Not to have enough to pay the bills, and not simply to have enough to be comfy. Wealthy means wealthy. Proclamation, place your hand on your heart and state. My destination is to become a millionaire and more. Touch your head and state. I've a millionaire mind. 1. Put down two financial objectives that demonstrate your intent to produce abundance, not mediocrity or poverty. Write play to win goals for your yearly revenue. Net worth. Make these goals accomplishable with an honest time frame, yet at the same time remember to shoot for the stars. 2. Go to an upscale restaurant and order a meal at market value without asking how much it costs. If finances are tight, sharing is accepted. No chicken. Chapter 4 Doing and Dreaming Synopsis Wealthy folks are committed to being rich. Poor individuals wish to be rich. Ask most individuals if they wish to be rich and they'd look at you as if you were loony. 
Naturally, I wish to be rich, they'd state. The reality, however, is that most individuals don't truly wish to be rich. How come? Because they have a lot of negative wealth files in their subconscious that tell them there's something wrong with being wealthy. Each of us has a wealth file inside the cabinet called our brain. This file contains our personal beliefs that include why being wealthy would be fantastic. However, for a lot of individuals, this file likewise includes data as to why being rich may not be so fantastic. This means they've mixed internal messages about wealth. One part of them joyfully states, having more cash will make life a lot more fun. But then a different part hollers, yeah, but I'm going to have to work like a dog. What fun is that? Do you act or dream? You may view it like this. The universe, which is a different way of stating higher power, is akin to a big mail-order department. It's perpetually delivering individuals, events, and matters to you. You order what you get by sending energetic messages out to the universe based on your prevailing beliefs. Again, based on the law of attraction, the universe will do its best to state yes and support you. But if you've mixed messages in your file, the universe can't comprehend what you want. One moment the universe hears that you wish to be wealthy, so it starts sending you chances for wealth. But then it hears you state, wealthy individuals are greedy, so the universe starts to support you in not having much cash. The frustrated universe ultimately shrieks, make up your frickin' mind. I'll get you what you wish, just tell me what it is. The first reason most individuals don't get what they wish is that they don't know what they wish. Wealthy individuals are totally clear that they want wealth. They're unwavering in their desire. They are totally dedicated to creating wealth. As long as it's legal, ethical, and moral, they'll do whatever it takes to have wealth. Rich individuals don't send mixed messages to the universe. Poor individuals do. Poor individuals have plenty of great reasons as to why getting and actually being wealthy may be an issue. Therefore, they're not 100% certain they truly want to be rich. Their message to the universe is confusing. Their message to other people is confusing. And why does all of this confusion occur? Because their message to themselves is confusing. I know it may be difficult to believe, but you always get what you want, what you subconsciously want, not what you state you want. You may emphatically deny this and respond, that's crazy. Why would I wish to struggle? And my question for you is precisely the same, I don't know. Why would you wish to struggle? Put bluntly, if you're not accomplishing the wealth you state you want, there's a good chance it's because, first, you subconsciously don't truly want wealth, or second, you're not willing to do what it takes to produce it. Let's explore this further. There are really three levels of so-called wanting. The first level is I wish to be rich. That's a different way of stating, I'll take it if it falls in my lap. Wanting alone is worthless. Have you noticed that wanting doesn't necessarily lead to having? Note likewise that wanting without having leads to more wanting. Wanting becomes habitual and leads only to itself, producing a perfect circle that goes precisely nowhere. Wealth doesn't come from merely wanting it. How do you know this is true? With a simple reality check, one trillions of individuals want to be wealthy, relatively few are. The second level of wanting is I opt to be rich and goes hand in hand with being responsible for producing your reality. Opting is better, but not best. The third level of wanting is I dedicate to being rich. This implies holding absolutely nothing back, giving a hundred percent of everything you've got to accomplishing wealth. It implies being willing to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes. 
This is the warrior's way. No excuses, no ifs, no buts, no maybes, and failure isn't a choice. The warrior's way is easy, I'll be rich or I'll die trying. I dedicate to being rich. Try stating that to yourself. What comes up for you? For some, it feels empowering. For other people, it feels intimidating. Most individuals would never really commit to being rich. If you asked them, would you bet your life that in the next 10 years you'll be wealthy? Most would say, no way. That's the difference between rich individuals and poor individuals. It's precisely because individuals won't really dedicate to being wealthy that they're not rich and most likely never will be. Some may say, what are you talking about? I work my butt off, I'm trying very hard. Naturally, I'm devoted to being rich. And I'd reply, that your trying means little. Most individuals I know who are not financially successful have limits on how much they're willing to do, how much they're willing to risk, and how much they're willing to sacrifice. Although they believe they're willing to do whatever it takes, on deeper questioning I always find they've plenty of conditions around what they're willing to do and not do to succeed. I hate to have to be the one to tell you this, but getting wealthy isn't a stroll in the park, and anybody who tells you it is either knows a heck of a lot more than me or is a bit out of integrity. In my experience, getting wealthy takes focus, bravery, knowledge, expertise, a hundred percent of your effort, a never give up attitude, and naturally a rich mentality. You likewise have to trust in your heart of hearts that you may produce wealth and that you utterly deserve it. Again, what this means is that, if you're not fully, totally, and truly dedicated to producing wealth, chances are you won't. Are you willing to work 16 hours a day? Rich individuals are. Are you willing to work 7 days a week and give up most of your weekends? Rich individuals are. Are you willing to sacrifice seeing your kinsperson, your friends, and give up your recreations and hobbies? Wealthy individuals are. For a time, hopefully a short time, but frequently a long time, rich individuals are ready and willing to do all of the above. Are you? Perhaps you'll be lucky and you won't have to work long or hard or sacrifice anything. You may wish for that, but I certainly wouldn't count on it. Again, wealthy individuals are committed enough to do whatever it takes. Period. It's intriguing to note, however, that once you do dedicate, the universe will bend over backward to support you. The universe will assist you, guide you, support you, and even produce miracles for you. But first, you have to dedicate. Proclamation, place your hand on your heart and state. I dedicate to being wealthy. Touch your head and say. I've a millionaire mind. Write a short paragraph on precisely why producing wealth is crucial to you. Be specific. Meet with an acquaintance or family member who's willing to support you. Tell that individual you wish to evoke the power of dedication for the purpose of producing greater success. Put your hand on your heart, look that individual in the eye, and repeat the accompanying statement. I, your name, do hereby dedicate to becoming a millionaire, date. Tell your partner to state, I believe in you. Then you say, thanks. Check in as to how you feel before your allegiance and how you feel after it. If you feel a sense of freedom, you're on your way. If you feel a hint of concern, you're on your way. If you didn't bother doing it, you're still in not being willing to do whatever it takes mode or I don't have to do any of this weird stuff mode. Either way, let me remind you, your way has gotten you right where you are today. Chapter 5 do you think big or small? Synopsis Wealthy individuals think big. Poor individuals think small. 
you'll be paid in direct proportion to the value you deliver according to the market. The key word is value. It's crucial to know that four factors determine your worth in the market, supply, demand, quality, and quantity. In my experience, the factor that presents the greatest challenge for most individuals is the quantity. The quantity factor plainly means, how much of your value do you actually deliver to the market? A different way of stating this is, how many individuals do you really serve or impact? In my business, for example, some trainers prefer teaching little groups of 20 individuals at a time, others are comfortable with a 100 participants in the room, others like an audience of 500, and still others love audiences of a 1,000 to 1,500 or more. Is there a difference in income among these trainers? You better believe there is. Think about the network marketing business. Is there a difference in income between somebody who is 10 people in his or her downline and soul who is 10,000 individuals? I think so. How do you wish to live your life? How do you wish to play the game? Do you wish to play in the major leagues or in the little leagues, in the majors or the minors? Are you going to play big or play little? It's your choice. Thinking big. Most individuals choose to play little. How come? First, because of concern. They're scared to death of failure, and they're even more frightened of success. Second, individuals play little, as they feel little. They feel unworthy. They don't feel they're great enough or important enough to make a true difference in people's lives. But hear this, your life isn't simply about you. It's also about contributing to other people. It's about living true to your mission and reason for being here on this earth at this time. It's about adding your part of the puzzle to the world. Most individuals are so stuck in their egos that everything revolves around me, me, and more me. But if you wish to be wealthy in the truest sense of the word, it can't only be about you. It has to include adding value to others' lives. We each came to this earth with innate talents, things we're just by nature good at. These gifts were given to you for a reason, to utilize and share with other people. Research shows that the happiest individuals are those who use their innate talents to the utmost. Part of your mission in life then must be to share your gifts and value with as many individuals as possible. That means being willing to play big. Do you know the definition of an entrepreneur? The definition I use is an individual who solves troubles for people at a profit. That's right, an entrepreneur is nothing more than an issue solver. So I ask you, would you rather solve troubles for more individuals or fewer individuals? If you were plagued more, then you have to start thinking bigger and decide to help massive numbers of individuals, one thousands, even one millions. The byproduct is that the more individuals you help, the richer you get, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and definitely financially. Make no mistake, each individual on this planet has a mission. I watch too many individuals playing far too small, and too many individuals letting their fear-based ego selves rule them. There's that too many of us are not living up to our total potential, in terms of both our own lives and our contribution to other people. It comes down to this, if not you, then who? Again, everybody has his or her unequaled purpose. Perhaps you're a real property investor and purchase properties to rent them out and make cash on cash flow and appreciation. What's your mission? How do you help? There's a great chance you add value to your community by assisting families find affordable housing they might not otherwise be able to discover. Now the question is how many families and individuals may you help? Are you willing to help 10 instead of 1, 20 rather than 10, 100 rather than 20? This is what I mean by playing big. The world doesn't need more individuals playing little. 
It's time to stop hiding out and begin stepping out. It's time to stop needing and begin leading. It's time to begin sharing your gifts rather than hoarding them or pretending they don't exist. In the end, little thinking and little actions lead to being both broke and unfulfilled. Big thinking and big actions lead to having both cash and meaning. The choice is yours. Proclamation, place your hand on your heart and state. I think big. I prefer to help one thousands and thousands of individuals. Touch your head and state. I've a millionaire mind. Put down what you feel to be your innate talents. These are things you've always been by nature good at. Likewise write how and where you may utilize more of these gifts in your life and particularly your work life. Put down or brainstorm with a group of individuals how you may solve issues for 10 times the number of individuals you impact in your job or business today. Come up with at least three different techniques. Think Leverage Chapter 6 Chances or Roadblocks Synopsis Rich individuals center on chances. Poor individuals center on roadblocks. Rich individuals see opportunities. Poor people see obstacles. Rich people see likely growth. Poor people see likely loss. Rich people center on the rewards. Poor center on the perils. It comes down to the age-old question, is the glass half empty or half full? We're not talking favorable thinking here. We're discussing your habitual perspective on the world. Poor individuals make choices based upon concern. Their brains are perpetually scanning for what is wrong or could go wrong in any spot. Their primary mentality is what if it doesn't work or, more frequently, it won't work. Middle class individuals are slightly more affirmative. Their mentality is I certainly hope this works. Rich individuals, as we stated earlier, take responsibility for the results in their lives and act on the mentality it will work as I'll make it work. Rich people anticipate succeeding. They've confidence in their abilities, they've confidence in their creative thinking, and they trust that should the do-do hit the fan, they may discover a different way to succeed. Generally speaking, the higher the reward, the higher the peril. As they constantly see opportunity, rich individuals are willing to take a risk. Rich individuals believe that, if worse comes to worst, they may always make their cash back. Take a good look at you. Poor people, expect to fail. They lack self-assurance in themselves and in their abilities. Poor individuals trust that should things not work out, it would be ruinous. And as they perpetually see roadblocks, they're commonly unwilling to take a risk. No risk, no reward. For the record, being willing to risk doesn't inevitably mean that you're willing to lose. Rich individuals take educated risks. This means that they research, do their due diligence, and make choices based on solid data and facts. Do rich individuals take forever to get educated? No. They do what they may in as short a time as possible, then make an informed conclusion to go for it or not. Although poor individuals claim to be preparing for a chance, what they're commonly doing is stalling. They're frightened to death, hemming and hawing for weeks, months, and even years on end, and by then the chance commonly vanishes. Then they rationalize the situation by stating, I was getting ready. Sure enough, but while they were getting ready, the wealthy guy got in, got out, and made another fortune. I know what I'm about to state might sound a bit unusual, considering how much I value self-responsibility. However, I do believe a particular element of what a lot of individuals call luck is associated with getting wealthy, or, for that matter, with being successful at anything. The point, however, is that no luck, or anything else worthwhile, 
will come your way unless you take some sort of action. To succeed financially, you have to do something, purchase something, or begin something. And when you do, is it luck or is it the universe or a higher power supporting you in its marvelous ways for having the bravery and dedication to go for it? As far as I'm concerned, who cares what it is? It occurs. A different key principle, pertinent here, is that rich individuals center on what they want, while poor individuals center on what they don't want. Again, the universal law says, what you center on expands. Because rich individuals center on the opportunities in everything, opportunities abound for them. Their greatest issue is handling all the incredible lucrative possibilities they see. On the other hand, as poor individuals center on the roadblocks and everything, roadblocks abound for them and their greatest issue is handling all the incredible roadblocks they see. It's simple. Your field of focus decides what you find in life. Center on opportunities and that's what you find. Center on roadblocks and that's what you find. Do you want some easy but exceedingly rare advice? Here it is. If you wish to get rich, center on making, keeping, and investing your cash. If you wish to be poor, center on spending your income. You may read a 1,000 books and take a 100 classes on success, but it all comes down to that. You must as well enter the arena where you wish to be in the future, in any capacity, to get moving. This is far and away the best way to learn about a business, as you see it from the inside. Second, you may make the contacts you postulate, which you could never have made from the outside. Third, once you're there many other doors of opportunity might open to you. That is, once you see what's really going on, you might discover a niche for yourself that you hadn't realized before. Fourth, you might find that you don't truly like this field, and thank goodness you found out before you got in too deep. I have a motto, action always beats an action. Rich individuals get moving. They trust that once they get in the game, they may arrive at intelligent decisions in the here and now, make corrections, and adjust along the way. Poor individuals don't trust in themselves or their abilities, so they trust they have to know everything beforehand, which is virtually impossible. Meanwhile, they don't do squat. Rich individuals see an opportunity, jump on it, and get even richer. As for poor individuals? they're still gearing up. Proclamations, place your hand on your heart and state. I center on opportunities over roadblocks. Touch your head and state. I've a millionaire mind. Get in the game. Consider a situation or project you've wanted to begin. Whatever you've been waiting for, forget it. Start now from wherever you are with whatever you've got. If possible, do it while working for or with somebody else, first, to learn the ropes. If you've already learned, no more excuses. Go for it. Rehearse optimism. Today, whatever anybody says is an issue or an obstruction, reframe it into an opportunity. You'll drive negative individuals nuts, but, hey, what's the difference? That's what they're constantly doing to themselves anyhow. Center on what you have, not on what you don't have. Make a list of 10 things you're thankful for in your life and read the list out loud. Then read it every morning for the next 30 days. If you don't appreciate what you've got, you won't get any more and you don't require any more. Chapter 7 You have to promote Synopsis some people are not so thrilled with any promotion regardless of how it may benefit them. If this sounds in any way like you, it's a crucial feature to notice about yourself. Resenting promotion is among the greatest obstacles to success. Individuals who have issues with selling and promotion are commonly broke. It's obvious. 
How can you produce a large income in your own business or as a representative of one if you aren't willing to let individuals know that you, your product, or your service exists? Even as an employee, if you aren't willing to promote your virtues, somebody who's willing will quickly bypass you on the corporate ladder. Distress Individuals have an issue with promotion or sales for many reasons. Chances are you may recognize one or more of the following. First, you might have had a bad experience in the past with individuals promoting to you inappropriately. Perhaps you sensed they were doing the hard sell on you. Perhaps they were bothering you at an inopportune time. Perhaps they wouldn't take no for an answer. Anyway, it's crucial to recognize that this experience is in the past and that holding on to it might not be serving you today. Second, you might have had a disempowering experience when you tried to sell something to someone and that individual completely rejected you. In this instance, your distaste for promotion is merely a projection of your own fear of failure and rejection. Once again, realize the past doesn't inevitably equal the future. Third, your issue may come from past parental programming. Many of us were told that it's impolite to toot your own horn. Well, that's excellent if you make a living as Miss Manners. But in real life, when it comes to business and cash, if you don't toot your horn, I guarantee nobody will. Rich individuals are willing to glorify their virtues and value to anybody who will listen and hopefully do business with them too. Finally, some individuals feel that promotion is beneath them. I call this the magisterial syndrome, otherwise called the aren't I so special, attitude. The feeling in that case is that if individuals want what you have, they ought to some way find and come to you. Individuals who have this belief are either broke or soon will be, that's for certain. They give the sack hope that everyone's going to scour the land searching for them but the reality is that the market is crowded with products and services, and even though theirs might be the best, no one will ever know that because they're too big head to tell anybody. Robert Kiyosaki points out that each business, including authoring books, depends upon selling. He notes that he's recognized as a best-selling author, not a best-writing author. One pays a lot more than the other. Rich individuals are commonly leaders, and all great leaders are excellent promoters. To be a leader, you must inherently have followers and supporters, which means that you have to be expert at selling, motivating, and inspiring individuals to buy into your vision. In brief, any leader who can't or won't promote won't be a leader for long, be it in government, business, sports, or even as a parent. The critical point here isn't whether you like to promote or not, it's why you're promoting. It comes down to your beliefs. Do you truly believe in your worth? Do you truly believe in the product or service you're offering? Do you truly trust that what you have will be a benefit to whomever you're promoting it to? If you believe in your worth, how could it possibly be appropriate to hide it from individuals who postulate it? Imagine you had a cure for arthritis, and you met somebody who was suffering and in pain with the disease. Would you hide it from him or her? Would you wait for that individual to read your mind or guess that you've a product that may help? What would you think of somebody who didn't offer suffering individuals their opportunity as they were too shy, too afraid, or too great to promote? More often than not, individuals who have an issue with promotion don't totally trust in their product or don't fully believe in themselves. Consequently, it's hard for them to imagine that others believe so strongly in their value that they wish to share it with everybody who comes their way and in any way they may. If you trust that what you have to offer may truly aid individuals, it's your duty to let as many hoi polloi as possible know about it. In that way, you not only help individuals, you get rich. Proclamation, place your hand on your heart and state. I promote my value to other people with passion and enthusiasm. Touch your head and state. 
I've a millionaire mind. Rate the product or service you're currently providing, or you're planning to offer, from 1 to 10 in terms of how much you trust in its value, 1 being the lowest, 10 being the highest. If your rating outcome is 7 to 9, revise your product or service to better the value. If your outcome is 6 or below, quit offering that product or service and begin representing something you really believe in. Study books, listen to audios and CDs, and take classes on marketing and sales. Become an authority in both of these areas to a point where you may promote your worth successfully and with 100% integrity. Chapter 8 Make your business work for you. Synopsis A major source of passive income is business working for you. This implies generating ongoing revenue from businesses where you don't need to be personally involved for that business to operate and yield a revenue. Examples include rental real property, royalties from books, music, or software packages, licensing your ideas, becoming a franchisor, possessing storage units, owning vending or other sorts of coin-operated machines, and network marketing, to name just some. It likewise includes setting up any business under the sun or moon that's systematized to work without you. It's a matter of energy. The idea is that the business is working and producing value for individuals, rather than you. Network marketing, for instance, is an amazing concept. First, it doesn't commonly require you to put up a lot of upfront capital. Second, once you've done the initial work, it lets you enjoy ongoing residual revenue, another sort of income without you working, year after year after year. Try producing that from a regular 9-to-5 job. I can't overstress the importance of producing passive revenue structures. It's easy. Without passive income, you may never be free. Make it work for you. But, and it's a big but, did you know that most individuals have a hard time producing passive revenue? There are three reasons. First, conditioning. Most of us were really programmed not to bring in passive income. Second, most of us were never taught how to bring in passive revenue. The end result is that most of us don't know much about it, and consequently don't do much about it. Finally, since we were never exposed to or schooled about passive revenue and investing, we have never given it much attention. We have mostly based our career and business choices on generating working revenue. If you understood from an early age that a primary financial goal was to produce passive revenue, wouldn't you reconsider some of those occupation choices? I'm always advocating to folks choosing or changing their business or career to discover a direction where generating streams of passive revenue is natural and relatively easy. This is particularly important nowadays as so many individuals work in service businesses where they have to be there personally to make cash. There's nothing awry with being in a personal service business other than that unless you get on your investment horse pretty soon and do exceptionally well, you'll be ensnared working forever. By choosing business chances that immediately or eventually produce passive revenue, you'll get the best of both worlds, working revenue now and passive income later. To increase your wealth, you have either to bring in more or live on less. I don't see anybody putting a gun to your head telling you the house you have to live in, the sort of car you have to drive, the clothes you have to wear, or the food you have to consume. You've the power to make selections. It's a matter of priorities. Poor individuals pick now, rich individuals pick balance. I hate to be the one to have to tell you this, but for the most part, purchasing things for immediate satisfaction is nothing more than a futile attempt to compensate for our dissatisfaction in life. More often than not, spending money you don't have comes from expending emotions you do have. Again, the idea is to have your cash work as hard for you as you do for it, and that means you have to save and invest instead of make it your mission in life to spend it all. 
Rich individuals purchase assets, things that will likely go up in value. Poor individuals purchase expenses, things that will definitely go down in value. Rich individuals collect land. Poor people collect bills. While poor individuals see a dollar as a dollar to trade for something they require today, rich individuals see each dollar as a seed that may be planted to earn a 100 more dollars, which may then be replanted to earn a 1,000 more dollars. Consider it. Each dollar you spend today might actually cost you a hundred dollars tomorrow. The trick is to get schooled. Become acquainted with an assortment of different investment vehicles and financial instruments, like network marketing, real property, mortgages, stocks, funds, bonds, currency exchange, the whole gamut. Then pick out one main area in which to become an authority. Start investing in that area and then diversify into more, later. It boils down to this. Poor individuals work hard and spend all their cash, which results in their having to work hard forever. Rich individuals work hard, save, and then invest their cash so they never have to work hard again. Proclamation, place your hand on your heart and state. My cash works hard for me and makes me more and more cash. Touch your head and state. I've a millionaire mind. Get schooled. Take investment seminars. Read Leastways one investment book or marketing a month. Read magazines like Money, Forbes, Barron's, and The Wall Street Journal. I'm not suggesting you abide by their advice. I'm suggesting you get acquainted with what financial choices are out there. Then pick out an arena to become an authority in and begin investing in that area. Change your focus from active revenue to passive revenue. List at least three specific techniques with which you may produce income without working in either the investment or the business field. Start researching and then take action on these techniques. Don't wait to purchase real property. Buy real property and wait. Wrapping up. I'm absolutely suggesting you put serious attention and energy into continuously learning and, at the same time, be cautious of whom you're learning and taking advice from. If you learn from those who are broke, even if they're advisors, coaches, or planners, there's only one thing they may teach you, how to be broke. I highly recommend you think about hiring a personal success coach. A great coach will keep you on track in doing what you've said you wish to do. A few coaches are life coaches, meaning they address the gamut of everything, while other coaches have specialties that may include personal or professional performance, finances, business, relationships, wellness, and even spirituality. Dedicate to your growth. Every month read at least one book. Listen to one educational tape or CD, or take a seminar on money, business, or personal growth. Your knowledge, your self-assurance, and your success will soar. Your financial design will determine your financial outcome. Make sure you do each of the exercises I suggested in order to start changing your design to one that supports financial success. I likewise encourage you to do the proclamations I suggested each and every day. You see, once you begin recognizing your non-supportive ways around finances, this awareness will transfer into every other part of your life.